Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to a, a tour of the Beulah Marble Quarry, which is probably Beulah's most historical claim to fame. This area behind you, or behind me, and where we're going to be traversing over here the next few minutes is the source of all the interior marble work of the Colorado State Capitol. It's a one of a kind of occurrence, and if you haven't been in the state capitol, I think it's well worth your time to go in and see what an exquisite product this was. This was uh, mined from 19, 1894 to 1900, and uh, pretty much shut down after the, uh, the capital work was finished. Um, the whole story here basically starts and ends with the state capitol. In uh, 1886, capital construction started, uh, 10 years after Colorado got statehood, and the state legislature mandated that all building materials came from the state of Colorado. So with that in mind, um, they started work on the Capitol, and, and in um, 1894, the in exterior work was finished, and they opened uh, the contracts up for bidding for the interior marble work. And that basically started a marble boom in Colorado. So the state capital managers invited interested parties to uh, submit samples of polished marble for consideration uh, in the competition for the contract for the interior marble work. And in response to that, in 1894, two quarries were opened up here in Beulah. There were two different owners. They were within a half mile of each other, but uh, we're standing at one of the quarries here, we're on the margin. You can't really see the quarry because it's down in the canyon. But uh, as we proceed today, we'll go down into this quarry and another quarry to the east. Uh, the two companies were um, owned by a fellow named Kelly and a fellow named Mattis. Kelly was from Denver and Mattis was from Pueblo. I believe this is the Mattis quarry. Uh, but and the, the second quarry we'll go to is probably the Kelly quarry but there's no direct evidence to say which is which. I'm going by the descriptions of the, of the marble. Um, one marble is much more elaborate than the other. So the marble was pretty much discovered in 1890. That's the first mention in the, the uh, Pueblo Chieftain of marble in Beulah. But it wasn't until the capital construction was well advanced that the, uh, there was a demand for the product. So those two quarries again opened in 1894 uh, commercial production began in early 1894 and um, pretty much continued nonstop till 1900 when the capital work was finished. Now that's the quick and dirty version. I think in the, as the tour proceeds I will talk more about the details because this was no different than your classic Colorado mining story of uh, speculation, litigation, fraud, uh, and, and the whole works. Um, so that's pretty much the history in a, in a nutshell. Um, what we're looking at here is the edge of the what I'm calling the central quarry. There were three different quarries that provided the majority of production for the state capital. They're all about the same size. Uh, I grew up here in the valley. Uh, it used to be a long hike into this area and I only knew about one quarry until just relatively recently and with satellite imagery and having a chance to explore the country two other quarries about the same size uh, were apparent. So we'll go down through two of the quarries here. Um, there's actually a total of six quarries but three are so small that they're pretty inconsequential. Uh, we're looking at the only remaining infrastructure of the, the whole mining process or the quarrying process here at the Beulah Marble Quarries. Tall structure you see here is the mast for the derrick that was used for lifting the marble out of the quarry. It's the only remaining uh, evidence of a quarrying operation here. It's been up there for at least 120 years. It's uh, probably what a 30 foot plus solid oak mast. It had to be brought in from somewhere else because there's no trees like that around here. There was a arm off the side of that mass that could be raised and lowered and pivoted out to the side so that it would go out over the quarry. The workers would lower the boom down and hook on a piece of marble to it with a chain. And then there was a large winch 
hand powered at the bottom of the mast and they could raise and lower that mast. They raise a block of marble up and then they'd pivot it out and put it on the surface here for trimming and loading. So what you're seeing here behind me is are the, are the blocks that they've lifted out of the quarry, kind of stockpiled on the surface. We'll go around the margins of them and you'll see these huge piles of chips where they hand trimmed the marble blocks into blocks. And you'll see some marble blocks that are halfway trimmed. But you can always tell where the derricks were because there's an arc of marble boulders around. I found four other locations where there's arcs of marble boulders. They had to have a derrick for lifting. I don't know if they had derricks that are long gone or if they moved operations sequentially. And this is the last operation. That's all speculative. So um, with that, in mind, we'll walk around to the quarry overlook and get a good overview of the, of the pits. I wanted to show you how beautiful some of this marble is. Uh, if you, you need to see it inside the state capitol to see the finished product, to see how beautiful it really is. But uh, the rough, this is one of the best remaining pieces here on the surface. I think they didn't bring it to the capitol because it's got a crack in it. but. If you wet the marble, you can see some of the color coming out in it. What's really unique about the Abula marble in relation to other sources of marble, the marble in Marble, Colorado, which is one of the most famous uh, marble products of the state, from which the uh, marble for the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier came from, is a, a real pure white marble very similar to what they get in Italy. This is unique in that it's got all this red and brown coloration and a lot of really elaborate, intricate patterns that uh, coalesce and diverge and it's a really dynamic product. And uh, to everybody's knowledge, there's not another source like this known in the US or probably in the world. And I'll, when we get into the geology portion, I'll explain a bit why that is. A lot of the coloration is much like tree rings. The red is from hematite, which most marbles don't have, which hematite is a iron oxide. The stellar patterns that you see are from uh, groundwater moving hematite through the um, host rock. If we continue on, we'll be walking over one of these areas where they used to trim the marble. And I found quite a few of these areas. They're just piles and piles of marble chips, small marble chips, uh, right next to where the boulders are. So here is a piece where they've put a rough square uh, cut on it. Um, they, they wanted to send as many or as much as a perfect product for cutting and polishing to Denver as they could because everything was hauled by wagon from here all the way to Pueblo, 25 miles away, to, to the railhead. And it may be a little hard to see, but you, there is quite a pile of chips here when you compare this area with the surrounding surface. So there had to be a workforce up here with chisels just trimming the marble blocks while the quarrying was in place. Okay, we're standing here at the south rim of the central quarry, probably one of the main sources of marble for the capital. I think uh, by the size of the pit here, the majority of production came from this area. But as you can see, it's not that big of a, a quarry or a disturbance. It's about 120 feet across by uh, 80 or so feet um, wide, and they probably only mined uh, 25 feet or 30 feet deep or so. So to me, it's really remarkable when you see the size of the pit, the relatively small size of the pit, that they got enough marble out for the whole state capitol. There are three complete floors of the state capitol have been, the wings cutting of the capitol is done in Beulah marble. The contemporary reports at the time said there were two miles of Beulah marble put into the state capitol. So when you look at this relatively small hole, you think, how did they get enough material out of here for that? Uh, and then when we 
talk about some of the geology, you'll see how difficult it was to mine. There were a lot of discontinuities in the marble, so a lot of it went over the edge. They just could not use it. They transported uh, basically three to four foot uh, cubes of marble to the capital. The, it was all wagon transport to Pueblo, so that limited how big a marble block they could actually haul. Um, I figured doing the calculation, they probably uh, could haul three and a half ton blocks, but it was mule and horse drawn wagon and over a pretty rough area to, to uh, all the way into Pueblo. So transportation was a real big problem. The mining method was a really big problem. It, it probably wasn't a very successful venture when it came right down to it. Uh, one of the quips that I, I found quite entertaining was the state capital manager said um, upon completion of the capital that the work of the Beulah Marble Company was completely unsatisfactory because they delayed, production problems delayed capital completion by years. It was way, way behind schedule. So, but when you see how difficult the, the product, the marble was to mine, you can kind of understand why it just wasn't a high production operation. The majority of mining was done by hand here. The process, all the, the, um, the drill holes were mined or drilled by hand where they called it uh, double jacking. And we recently found through the historical society some old photographs of the operation in progress. And it shows two man double jack teams. One man's holding a chisel bit steel of varying lengths while the other poor part of the team is swinging a sledgehammer. And uh, uh, contemporary accounts said they pretty much did one swing per second. So they were constantly hammering away all day long and drilling these holes. And as we go down in the quarry, you can see the traces of these holes. They're very, very irregular because of the hand drilling method. You can tell the difference between a machine drilled hole and a hand drilled hole by how smooth the sides are. So there's no evidence here of any machine drilling at all. Lots of evidence of hand drilling. They didn't use high explosives here. Uh, dynamite shatters the rock, but I found a lot of black 25 pound blasting powder cans. It's just essentially black powder. That's a low velocity explosive that tends, tends to, to crack the rock. So they used uh, black powder here as their blasting agent, hand, uh, hand drilling for the majority of the mining. Now one real recent discovery we made uh, both in the new photographs and in the research uh, for the quarry history was in 1894, no actually it was 1895, they mentioned that quarrying operations were well underway and they were buying mechanized equipment and they mentioned a channeler. I had no idea what a channeler was, but I figured, well, whatever it was, it was just kind of promotion and they never, get, never uh, got it here. The Historical Society found a photograph that showed this piece of, of steam equipment that doing a little bit of research showed it was a channeler. And what a channeler was, it was a, a steam powered quarrying uh, um, machine that was real prevalent in the quarries back east. And it looked like a little locomotive uh, with a kind of a steam engine. It was mounted on rails, so it would move up and down rails. And on either side were vertical chisel bits or bars. And the steam engine would turn a cog just like a locomotive, raise the bits up and down. And the, uh, the accounts, the engineering reports of how it works said it, it would go 100 to 200 times a minute. So this thing was constantly pounding and it would chisel a three quarter inch a, a deep slot every time it made a pass, but it would cut down four to six feet. So this thing would be going on rails back and forth three quarters of an inch at a time. So I, th I thought, well, that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, we found it in the photograph, but there was no evidence that it, ex it was used beyond just being in that photograph. So I started looking throughout the quarry for any signs of the cut that it made and in an uh, area we're going to go to further down the pit, there was one place, maybe two feet across, that had a cut, it looked like a big cut by a knife blade. 
and that was the channeler cut. And I started excavating it and found a 20 foot long straight as an arrow cut, like you cut it with a saw, four feet deep with perpendicular cuts defining where they cut the marble blocks out. So there is a, they use that relatively early on and in one of the historic photos you can actually see the same cut that I excavated uh, in the photograph from probably 1900 or eight, somewhere in the 1895 to 1900 uh, range. So this is some of the best remaining marble pieces, very high quality uh, still uh, remaining on site, equivalent to what they were mining in the capital. And I don't want to step on a snake here, so I'm stepping cautiously, but uh, let's wet one of these pieces here so you can see the how colorful it is once you get a polish on it. Uh, this particular piece here, there's some pieces in the capital that are almost identical to it. It really brings out the color with polishing or wetting. And I do have one example here that I had polished. Once you, the rough pieces are pretty, but you really need a polish on it to bring out the colors. And it, uh, it makes it quite vibrant compared to the, the pieces that have, these pieces have been here laying out here for 125 years, they faded, but cut them, polish them. The interior is as good as the day it was mined. Well, what I wanted to show from this vista point is we're looking across the canyon from the quarry and the gray rock you see forming cliffs uh, on the canyon walls there is the same formation that hosts the marble here. It's a pretty famous formation within Colorado. It's called the Leadville Limestone. It hosts a lot of mineral deposits from throughout the state, mostly lead, zinc, silver, some uranium, but here it hosts marble. The marble, though, is very uh, localized. It, it is not pervasive. It only occurs in um, old small deposits, pretty much the size of the pit that we, we see. We look across, as we look across at the limestone across the canyon, there's no marble whatsoever. It's just a normal limestone. It's just, there's no red coloration in it whatsoever. And when I talk about the geology, I'll explain why that is. But uh, the far cliffs that you see on the skyline over there is the exact same formation uh, as we're standing on here at the quarry. It's about 200 feet thick there. Uh, here at the quarry, it's only about 60 feet thick. And a mile and a half to the south of us, it's completely gone. And that variation in thickness had a lot to do with the marble formation. And I'll explain that once we get down into the quarry. But uh, that's part of the evidence for saying that this marble here is very, very old, formed in the geologic past, probably about 300 million years ago. Here we're down in the central quarry. It gives one of the best views of the, the pit. Um, you can so look back toward the mast uh, and pretty much easily see how they could have used that uh, derrick arm to swing it out over the, the pit, lower it down and, and uh, pick up marble blocks to hoist to the surface. There's actually a pile of marble blocks there at the base of the derrick that were not raised up to the surface for some reason. Uh, as you can see, we're not very deep, really. The, we're probably just 30 feet below the surface here. And they just mined the edge of the cliff. Uh, that All the marbles toward the top, 30 feet or so of the Leadville Formation. And there's a, when I get into the geology, I'll explain why that is. There's nothing, there's not marble down below us for any considerable distance. It's always at the top of the formation and localized into sort of circular areas. So we're looking back out over the, the walls of the, the pit here, and they actually stopped uh, where there was no marble left. They pretty much extracted the easily mineable material, and they, when I get into the geology, I'll explain why they stopped where they did. Uh, if they'd gone around the margins, I'm pretty convinced they would have found more marble. 
So we're looking at in, in inf the infilled pit, debris, uh, marble pieces that were just not big enough to ship. But I mentioned the channeler, and I'd like to show you the channel cut now. So we come over here, and we can see a nice, beautifully li linear cut about 20 feet long, uh, and it's four to five feet deep. This is where the, the chisel bits of the steam-powered channeler cut down through the marble uh, to make marble blocks. Uh, originally, there was only this surface exposed, and probably for a course of a year, I've been digging this out to expose the full extent. I'm not done. Um, you can see the one cut uh, 20 feet long. There's a series of perpendicular cuts that are every three and a half feet apart, or every three and a half feet. And I think those almost certainly define the blocks of the marble. They couldn't make it any wider than that or just because of the transportation limitations. So that's, as I mentioned earlier, it'd probably be about a three and a half or four ton block of marble. Uh, one of the big surprises in the bottom of this trench, it's collapsed a little bit, but there's another channel or cut in the bottom. And this leaves about an inch or inch and a half wide cut, almost like you'd cut it with a, a saw, but it was this, this chisel bit that did that. If we can get the camera over here, you can see the, actually I will get down in the pit, or the cut, and I can show you these perpendicular cuts. So every three and a half feet, there's a perpendicular cut. They're perfectly, perfectly perpendicular where they set up the channeler to cut the blocks. Now this must have been an incredible thing or difficult piece of equipment to set up. It had to be perfectly level. It had to be mounted on rails. Uh, this is an irregular marble quarry, and I imagine they ran into a lot of problems with this, which is why this is the only known evidence that they used a channeler. Everything else is mined by hand. And we're at the north margin of the pit, which is what would have been mined early on. In fact, all this debris that I moved out of here to expose the cut is fill from later mining operations as the pit moved to the south, rather than dump all the waste rock over the edge, they just infilled the cut from earlier mining operations. So really we don't know how much fill is in here in the quarry and it might actually go deeper than we think in this particular area. But this channeler was completely unknown until probably a year ago. We, there was no historical evidence or reference to it other than one 1895 article in the Pueblo Chieftain. And from following up on that, we found the photo that, of the channeler in action and um, the evidence that it was used here. So uh, the, as we move to the south, I'll show you some of the hand mining evidence and then we'll be moving into the other quarry. Uh, what I'd like to do next is explain how the marble formed. It's a very complex process and it's, it's not a, an easy explanation, but I'll, I'll try to do it as simply as I can without getting into the geologic jargon, which would actually make it a lot easier for me. This is not a conventional marble uh, deposit. Technically, in the geologic sense of the term, a marble is a limestone that has been changed by heat and pressure and recrystallized. The marble at Marble Colorado is a classic marble. If you look up close, you'll see really coarse grain texture because the, the heat and the pressure recrystallizes the rock so that it's completely a different type of rock. That didn't happen here. And technically, in the geologic sense, this is not a marble. It's, a, it's a lot, still a limestone. There's no evidence of uh, any intrusion that would uh, provide the heat. Um, the geologic history is such that there's no pressure to change this. And you can walk outward into normal limestone laterally from the marble deposit. 
So the question is, well, okay, if it's not a marble, then what is it and how did it form? And the explanation of that is I have to define some terms. It, uh, it's a karst process, um, and specifically paleokarst, which is essentially, as you'd expect, ancient karst. Karst refers to the dissolution of limestone. So whenever you have a limestone exposed at the surface, it starts to dissolve. And rainwater, which is mildly acidic, naturally, starts to infiltrate along cracks and crevices and joints and form caves. Um, caves, caverns, sinkholes are all karst features. So what the geologic evidence is showing us here is this is a, an ancient karst system. So the, the normal limestone that I explained to you earlier is just a normal gray, boring limestone, monotonous. Uh, wherever you look at it, it's pretty much the same. No iron in it whatsoever. But as you get into the quarries, you start to see evidence of paleokarst, which is just the caves and caverns that were infilled, that were formed shortly after the limestone is exposed at the surface. Limestones are, and especially this one, are marine in nature. They form underneath the ocean. Either sea levels drop or the limestone or the, the continental mass rises and exposes the limestone. As soon as it's exposed to the surface, it starts this process of dissolution. So you get caves forming where the caves get big enough, they collapse and they form sinkholes. And we've all seen on the news how a sinkhole will open up in Florida and things start falling in. Well, the same thing happened here, but 300 million years ago. And the evidence for that is actually here on the side of the, the quarry wall. Instead of a nice marble, uh, in the conventional sense of the term, or the, um, I will explain one thing here. I still use the term Beulah marble because it's kind of a trade name, but a marble is also used as a name commercially for any limestone that will take a polish. So this still is as a marble, but not in the geologic sense. So I, I still use the word marble a lot. So going back to our paleocars feature, instead of seeing limestone on the wall here, or marble, we're seeing this really chaotic, rubbly natured rock, and it's called a breccia. And if we look up close, we'll see fragments of rock within the rock. It's like cement almost, but all the fragments are angular. This was a, a sinkhole 300 million years ago. And after the the limestone was exposed at the surface, the next formation or the next event to be deposited here, the next uh, sedimentary strata, was the fountain formation, which is red throughout Colorado. Red rocks in Colorado is the fountain formation. We know how red it is. All of the Gula Valley here is in the same formation. It's red because it has a lot of iron oxide and hematite in it. So the first of thing that happened when that depositional event occurred was all the caves and the caverns and the sinkholes got infilled with real iron rich red sediment. And you can see how red the wall is here. So this is the margin of a sinkhole that is infilled with limestone blocks and the red sediment from the post limestone depositional event. The wall here, it's probably a little hard to see, is entirely composed of fragmental rock. This was a, a collapsing cavern and limestone was, fragments were falling into the hole. And in addition, the red rock, the red sediment was infilling the hole. So as we look at the wall up here, we can actually see an infilled cavern with red fountain formation sediment right here. This is not limestone or at, at all. It's uh, just a local little cavern that was infilled with the, the red iron rich sediment. So as, as water moved through this, it leached iron out in the real porous breccia into the surrounding limestone. And that's what formed the marble. So all those bands that you see are from 
uh, probably like seasonal uh, precipitation events where groundwater is moving through the rock. And sometimes it's in solution, sometimes it's precipitating. So the, the individual bands in the marble are where the iron was precipitated. I've walked probably all these outcrops in the whole area, and you only find marble where there's evidence of the, what I'm calling paleocarst, or what we call paleocarst in the geologic world. So it's a complex uh, process. Uh, over on the wall over there, we have a, an infilled cavern of red hematitic shale. Sometimes the iron content is such that it, it's really a dense rock, so a lot of iron was moving through. But when it hit the limestone, the, the limestone's more reactive and it precipitates the, the iron. So we'll go over here on this wall and you can actually see really nicely an infilled cavern with marble underneath it. The best quality marble with the most vibrant coloration was always in proximity to the sinkholes. So what I just showed you on the south wall of the pit is a, just a classic infilled sinkhole. But that's why the, the quarry stopped and why they stopped mining uh, marble at the south end. They hit the sink infilled, infilled sinkhole and stopped mining because they thought that was the end of the marble. I'm certain there's marble underneath it and I'm certain there's marble off to the sides because sinkholes are circular. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more and show you some evidence for that. But here we can see we're out on the margins of the sinkhole and you can see where the sinkhole fill is thinner and the marble is underneath. So right here where I'm showing, have my hammer, is this is sinkhole fill. It's a breccia. There's no marble at all, in it at all. It's, it's waste rock. They had to mine all this, throw it over the edge to get to the marble down below. And we can see an infilled cavern Right in here, you can see this irregular, uh, sort of scalloped feature. It's infilled with red, hematite-rich uh, siltstone and shale. So this was a, an open cavity at the time of the deposition of the fountain formation. So uh, it may not show very well on camera, but some of this is extremely rich in iron. Uh, you can see it kind of glinting here in the sun, perhaps. That's hematite, which is the iron oxide. So this was the source of the iron. It leached out of the sediment, and as soon as it hit the limestone, it started to precipitate. And this is a weathered outcrop, but this is all high quality marble down below it. And in fact, over here, you can see the intricate, vibrant, coloration of the iron oxide uh, bands in the, the marble. This also shows you the difficulty they had in mining this. Uh, imagine with all these irregularities, how do you get a three and a half or four foot square block? It probably didn't happen very often. Uh, and they must have been very frustrated when they were mining high quality marble, because the best stuff was at the margins of these sinkholes, and they hit uh, an infill cavern like this that um, is just waste. They couldn't mine any further. They would have had to go deeper or off to the side. So it's, again, it's really remarkable that they found enough marble here to complete the capital. Uh, I mentioned the formation thickness of the Leadville limestone. When we go uh, about a mile or two to the north, the Leadville is its original thickness about 200 feet thick. But as you come into the quarry area, it's only about 60 feet thick because of this karst erosion. Before the overlying strata was deposited, more than half of the whole formation was eroded away. Uh, and when we talk about these breaches, you can actually see the fragments of the missing rock formations inside the sinkholes. And as we go to the south about a mile, the Fountain formation sits right on top of the Precambrian. There's about 1.3 billion years of history missing there. So that's how we know this thing formed really relatively early, basically at 
or slightly after deposition of the overlying uh, sedimentary rock. Uh, there's some other evidence that shows that this is an extremely old, 300 million year old occurrence. The sinkhole uh, hypothesis also explains why there's three different deposits or three different quarries. So, and why they're kind of circular because sinkholes are circular, the marble was around the margins of them as you, there's still a lot of caves around the margins that are infilled. So the marble uh, quality and amount decreases laterally outward from a sinkhole. Sinkholes occur in clusters. There's a lot of modern uh, examples and you'd expect there to be other marble deposits and indeed there's some small ones that were exposed in the new road up into this area about 20 years ago. We actually drive through uh, another source of marble that I, in a different time and place, uh, I would love to be quarrying marble. <laughs> but uh, we, we won't be doing that uh, uh, in these days. So very limited supply. They were extremely fortunate to be able to have enough to finish the capital. Uh, lucky, extremely lucky. Um, but they had to work really hard to get what they did. So what we'll be doing now is walking over to the other quarry, but essentially walking our way out of the marble deposit. And there's still some really nice exposures along this ledge that's been mined. It's been mined for another 150 feet past the main quarry. But as you get out laterally from the sinkhole, the, the action of the karst and the iron mobilization wasn't as pronounced. So the marble thickness decreases outward and the quality decreases outward till it just pinches down to nothing. So this, this little transition we'll be walking along, it shows that feature, but it also shows uh, the mining method very well too. So we'll proceed along here. And every place we're walking has been mined. And there's still some trimmed blocks here. Uh, you know, I don't know why they were still here. They were probably left meaning to hoist out and there were some irregularities, but you can see this is a rectangular block that's all been hand trimmed. Now, one interesting thing you can see on this wall here is with exposure, the marble weathers to a, a very boring drab gray color, but there's still places where you can see the marble underneath it here. This is really still high quality marble that's left. These are the drill holes that were hand drilled. They're sort of triangular and extremely irregular, but they're basically every three feet here or so. So you know, there would have been a two man team standing up on top of this surface, pounding that steel down. It would have taken them probably an hour or two to drill that hole by hand. And then they would have filled that with the blasting powder and just probably the minimal amount that they needed just to pop the rock. So you can see there's kind of a break there at the top of that uh, marble. I'll show you right where it is, right about here. That's the top of the marble, and above that is the waste rock they had to remove. That's part of the lateral karst breaches that is just sort of trash rock. They had to strip off that, throw it over the side before they could get down to the marble horizon. There's some really nice exposures of marble as we move along this ledge. And they mined it for about 100 feet or so laterally, but right here, what, we've got maybe 12 feet of marble that they extracted. And it just gets thinner and thinner as we move to the east. This is one of my favorite pieces here that really shows some of the coloration in the marble. So down below it, you can see where the drill holes are. They, here they're only mining blocks, maybe three feet thick. And in the ledge up above us, it's also been mined, but we're getting the marginal quality out here. A lot of voids and imperfections. The other interesting thing is each quarry has its own type of marble. 
and there's variations within each quarry too. So you can see this is the, the high quality marble. As we get down in here, it's got more imperfections, more voids and the like. Uh, I spent hours in the state capitol and you can match individual marble panels in the capitol with air, the individual quarries and the areas of the quarry there. Some places, uh, well, actually in the next quarry, I'll show you a piece uh, of uh, both, hopefully, um, a wall in the state capitol and the wall in the, the quarry, and they can match them up almost identical. It's like, a, um, I don't know, tree rings or a EKG signature that just matches perfectly. That block in the state capitol came from that area. So it's, it's kind of neat when you know the very subtle variations, how you can match different parts of what you see in the capitol with the, with the actual location in the field. And they were pretty smart. Uh, they were, and actually, the, whoever installed the marble of the Capitol was an artist. There's no doubt about it. The way the, the patterns match the architecture, and then you can see the complexity of these things. They're really intricate patterns, but the person that put those together made them flow, the patterns flow. It, it's really a masterpiece, in my opinion. Uh, but they also used the best quality, the most dynamic, vibrant pieces in the main thoroughfare areas. And you get into the side halls, it's where kind of the crappy stuff was, or the lesser quality marble. But you can, you can see a, a notable difference. But the people were thinking when they installed that marble. They were true. I don't think you can match that craftsmanship now. It's, it's such a remarkable uh, our, uh, piece of work. The other thing too that's kind of interesting is it's not just flat marble pieces. There's elaborate cornices and, and trim work. Colorado House of Representatives and Senate Chamber are all trimmed in Beulah marble, uh, as all the hallways are. There's one hallway that has pedestals of oct octagonal Beulah marble uh, on a, a white Ewell marble floor. It's, it's really a remarkable job uh, that Colorado should be very proud of the work they did in that capital. I, I don't think there's any other capital that's quite the level of art, I'd call it art, uh, in the state capital, our state capital. Okay, we're over in the, what I'm calling the East Quarry. And in spite of growing up in the valley and, and uh, being here many years, I only knew this quarry existed about three years ago. And most people I don't think know it, it exists, but it was mined at the same time, or may perhaps even earlier, as the, the first quarry we visited. It, uh, it has a more uh, mundane type of marble. It doesn't, isn't quite as vivid, but it's pretty diagnostic. It's probably harder and has less irregularities. It's uh, more of a pinkish type of marble. So we're standing at the west end of the pit and the really remarkable thing about this quarry to me is there are two historical photos of uh, the miners at work in, this, in the quarry that we all assumed was in the first quarry we visited. But without a doubt, those photos were taken at this spot. In fact, I'm standing probably right where the camera was. And we'll hopefully show the photo uh, so you can see how it matches up but we can match individual drill holes on the quarry wall and the strata that we see now with the, those in that photo. The only thing missing are the miners, but that photo was taken over 120 years ago. So this is the exact spot of that location. The other thing that it shows kind of incidentally is there's a cable cutting across the old photo heading that direction. And if we look at that arc of marble boulders, the mast for the derrick was almost certainly where that, where there's a dead pine there right now. There's a flat level spot. So they had cables coming up here to that derrick and mast that was used for lifting the blocks out and up onto the surface. Most of the marble blocks are, are gone up there, but we'll be walking along the old original quarry road that all the quarry, all the marble was used to haul out, was came out, went out on that way. 
And actually there's two piles, huge piles of trimmed marble fragments and some very nicely uh, squared marble boulders still up there. So we'll just be walking down through this quarry. There isn't much to see, it's quite overgrown, but probably an equal volume of marble was taken out of that. Paleocarst features here are much less well developed. There's local caverns that are infilled, but there's no big sinkhole, which explains why the, the marble here isn't as vibrantly colored as what we saw in the other quarry. It's still beautiful, but it doesn't have the, the quite dynamic quality as the other, or, nor as many colors. And in, I think it was February or March of 1894 in the Pueblo Chieftain, when they described two quarries, they said about almost the same thing, that one quarry had much more dynamic, uh, vibrant colors than the other. And that's what I use for being qualifying statement on this is probably the Kelly Quarry, the other one is the Mattis Quarry, based on that article. So we're on the east side of the east or probably the Kelly Quarry here. Looking at the quarry wall, you can see the hand drill holes here. There's no evidence of any channeler being used at all in this area. It was all uh, excavated by hand. And there's some really unique features here in the wall that uh, enable us to tell or place some of the marble in the state capital exactly into this location. We can see a, a, a series of faint lines that are jagged. They're like an EKG uh, trace or a seismograph trace. There's uh, four of them here. There's another one here. These are called styolites. Whenever you subject a limestone to uh, pressure, it starts to dissolve along mineral grains. And as it dissolves, it kind of compacts. Any insoluble material in the limestone gets concentrated on the styolites. So you can see there's little uh, iron-rich veinlets here that had hematite in them. And hematite concentrated on the limestone, on the stylites here. So this hematite was here very early on because they're cross-cut by, the hematite and the fractures was here early on because it was cross-cut by the stylites. So as this limestone got buried with the iron-filled fractures and joints and the like, the iron got concentrated along these stylites. So it tells you that the iron was here very early on, before deep burial. And uh, it pretty much constrains the, the age of the, the marble. So if it had been after that, or after the iron, it, or had the marble formed uh, after that, you wouldn't have these cross-cutting relationships. So this had to be formed pre-deep burial, which was probably... Uh, 250 million years ago. Now the other really unique thing about this is I mentioned there's four stylites here that are close together and widely spaced ones down here. In one portion of the state capitol there's a panel with this exact same relationship. So that block in the state capitol came from almost right here. And there's no other place that has this particular relationship. The uh, stylites in the other quarry are very irregular. Apparently there was dissolution and, and uh, uh, collapse and brecciation concurrent with deeper burial. So the stylites are every which way, but this is the only place they are nicely planar and almost like matching tr tree rings in tree ring uh, chronology, we can match this particular rock face with what's in the state capitol. We're standing now at the east limit of the east quarry. Uh, there's no more marble to the east of here. This is pretty much the end of the deposit. And if you look back, maybe the sun's not quite right, but you get a good view of the quarry floor and how they just essentially mined a notch out of the cliff, top of the cliff. And the marble, again, is located always at the top of the formation. Okay, we're standing at the processing and loading facility 
or what's left of it, rather, for the east quarry. We're just up on top of the rim. And what we see here are lar big, large piles of trimmed marble fragments where they were forming the marble blocks for shipment. And quite a, there's quite a few rectangular uh, marble pieces with ch uh, chisel marks on them where they were uh, probably had some defect or something for some reason they didn't ship them but they're scattered all around here and some of the rough pieces are in a large arcuate uh, shape and I think right where we're standing they had to be another derrick that uh, for lifting the blocks out of the quarry and that fits very well with what we see in the old photos about the cables and the angles leading up to this inferred location of the derrick. And I think that's significant in that this was the most likely spot for where the fatality occurred when that mast fell over and killed the worker. His name was uh, Merritt Aldridge, and he, I think he was 30-some years old. Uh, he left behind a, a wife, a pregnant wife, and I believe it was four or five children. So a pretty tragic uh, fatality. He's buried in the Beulah Cemetery in an unmarked grave. Uh, but this is the most likely site for that uh, accident. Uh, the wagon road uh, terminated here for this quarry, and there are two piles of, of chips where they were trimming the blocks, and then I think they used the hoist to lift the marble blocks onto the wagon here in the that was parked here in the central area. And then it began its long journey from here to Pueblo, a uh, two-day journey by horse-drawn wagon uh, till the, to the railhead in Denver, or to the to railhead in Pueblo, and then on to Denver for processing. All the marble was processed in downtown Denver at a facility uh, where the Elitch parking lot is now. It's kind of, a, kind of sad, it's all um, gone. But they must have had a pretty elaborate a marble, marble cutting and polishing and finishing uh, area there in Denver. And that's another thing to be investigated uh, as part of the quarry history. So that pretty much concludes the uh, contour of the two main quarries here where the majority of production came from. There is a third quarry uh, uh, off to the west, but the marble quality was much inferior. And the only place I've seen that marble installed in the capital is in the back hallways. It's, uh, it's not as dynamic as uh, the marble produced in either one of these quarries. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your interest in the Beulah Marble Quarry and the Beulah Historical Society and for coming along on our virtual tour here. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you about what we Beulah residents are so proud about. Um, thank you again. And until the next time.